All right, hey guys. We're back for our weekly uh, get together with a Q and A for real estate and um, uh, business investments. Hey, Luke. Thanks, buddy. Luke. You want me to show you? Uh... <laughs> hey. Thanks, Luke. We're at the mortgage conference, the national mortgage conference, actually, or the the state mortgage conference. Uh, lots of good stuff. My boy Joey here learning a lot. Trying. So I'm going to talk about the nine unit deal and explain the profitability of the deal because um, Joey asked some questions and he got certain points and he was like wowed by them. But then I repeated certain points again. I just picked up different nuggets. And yeah, and then he's like, wow, wait, there's like other ways to make money. So like. Go through all the different ways to make money on that deal, uh, so you guys can see how it uh, it works out. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, we didn't get to go to the lazy river yet. It's quite annoying. We have missed it for two days in a row. All right, I got my co co host Joey here. Co host here. Hey. All right. Let him know. So um, we're going to give it one more minute and then we're going to start. We're going to start this thing and I'm going to go through the, the nine-unit property that I just bought. Um, cool. Question then before everyone gets in. Mm -hmm. So to clarify what we mm -hmm. learned at the mortgage convention, you, it was, you said that you can be co-borrower on somebody else's credit card. And pull all the credit history from that credit card, and I can add it to mine. Yeah, so that's a credit, it's like a credit a hack. credit hack. Yep, and that's one of the ways I actually did my own. Um, got my credit like went from zero to like a seven twenty within like a few months. So all right, so we'll start with that credit hack. So all you guys trying to build your credit. So credit basically is. Um, People vouching for you. But instead of people vouching saying, hey, is Joe good for it? I'm going to let him borrow money. Instead of having people, what you could go to is a credit score. And that credit credit score says, how reliable are you? So another – so that's what your credit score is. Now, if you don't have a credit score, how you actually get it going and get it started is you get a credit card. And this credit card basically is a – a company vouching for you, saying, hey, you're trustable, telling the credit bureaus, this guy's trustable, you can give him money, he pays on time, and all that good stuff. So now that takes time to build, to build trust with that credit card, to build trust with the credit bureaus. So what I was telling Joe to do, and this is the hack, is that you can get on your brother's credit card. Your brother has a credit card. He's had it for two years. He, has, he doesn't owe anything on it. He's paid on time, never any problems. If he adds you on as a co-borrower, right? Co-borrower means you're both reliable to pay the debt on the card. You will then, on your credit history, it'll show the card, and you're gonna get that two years that he's paid good on it and all the good stuff from the card. But if they said if he's done bad on the card, has negative info on the card, you'll get the negative info too. So be careful. So if he owes a lot of debt on it, you'll get the high debt. But if he doesn't owe much on it, they'll show low debt. My point is this. You automatically, by signing up on that car as a co-borrower, you automatically now get the two years of history. You went from zero to two years. What I did is I got on to two of my, my parents, two of their cards. One had like five years, one had 10 years. Wow. So day, yeah, day one, I had like seven and a half years average history. Automatic, boom, from like no credit, just got my social a few months prior to boom. I had a 720 credit score within a few months. Obviously, all the lenders were loving me. So, oops. And on that note, is there a limit to how many credit cards you can get on as co-borrower? No. There's not? No. Now, again, you don't want to go crazy with Obviously, it. Obviously, yeah. Um, and I ha currently, I have like 20 credit cards. Um, each one has a specific purpose. Each one's assigned to one of the companies I own. So it's not a big deal having that many credit cards. But yeah, by signing on to someone that has good history, with the card has good history, you get the, that history 
on your credit and you automatically jump your credit score up. Um, what's up, Joe? Now, we have so some, some questions. What city was the multifamily you just purchased? It was in Safety Harbor, Florida in the downtown part. So it's like a really, really hot area of Pinellas County. And, and not only that, it was in the downtown section, which is extremely desired area. So it was like a steal. You know, day one it went up, like minute one it went up. I saw it. I called them and I said, hey, I'm going to give you exactly what you're asking for it because I knew there's so much value in that property. Um, so, yeah, it's awesome. That's why it's important when you're an investor, you stay on the market. you got to be on it. Yeah, you got to be on it all the time. So what would also be awesome to hear about the effort you put in to get where you are? So, yeah, Cody, um, because I didn't know what I was doing, what I could control is how much energy and effort I could put in. So I put in a lot of time. Now, I enjoy the time I put in because I actually like the game and I wanted to learn how to play the game. So it's like if you could imagine any game you're playing, any type of sport you're playing and you want to play it like – I compare it like this. Like I don't play sports, you know, um, but if I was like um, like a basketball player, they play basketball their whole life. When they're a kid, they played basketball. As a profession, they played basketball, and when, when they retired, they still played basketball. I see that the same thing in, in the real estate game, in the, in the business world. I like it, right? Um, I'm going to do it forever, right? It's never a stop for me because I just – I love this shit, right? It's a lot of fun. So I was always learning because it's just my game. So I was putting in a lot of effort, and but it was, it was a lot of fun along the way. Learning all this stuff, thinking, oh, wow, this is so cool. Like a lot of stuff I'm teaching Joe, he's like all the time, he's like, wow, that's so cool. I, I never heard of this. There's a lot of things out there that's really cool and a lot of fun to learn and to practice. At the same time, there's a lot of shit that's like you'll get burned on and it kind of like is disappointing. So it's just part of the game. Just like if you, again, like I see people playing sports, basketball, whatever, and shit doesn't go their way and it, it sucks. So... That's kind of something you need to uh, just know it's part of the game. But I put in a lot of effort to simplify the answer. I put in a lot, a lot of effort. Um, let's go name badge. So, um, yeah. So, again, to let you guys know, we're here in Orlando for the national uh, mortgage events, uh, meeting all the vendors because we're going to be offering mortgages very soon for Florida, New Jersey, and uh, California. Yes, sir. Um, and on a national level for hard money lending, fix and flips, and stuff like that. So if you need a loan, uh, we'll be able to hook you guys up soon uh, for anything um, that you need. So let us know. DM us if you want us to get into your state as well for regular uh, home loans. All right, let's see here. If there's any other questions. All right. What's up, Ryan? We, we got people from uh, Jordan at 4 a.m. They're up at 4 a.m. just to watch us go live. That's awesome. That's sick. That's what I like to see. Thanks, Eva. All right, let's see what other questions we got here. Um, interested in Cali. Yeah, so and I'm getting a license for California loans as well. Um, hard money loans, everything. So you need help? We, I'll definitely help you with that. What did Joey learn day one at the convention? So, Joey, what did you learn day one at the convention? Um, What did I learn day one at the convention? There was a lot of information to soak in. A whole lot of information, especially not being... Not being really knowledgeable about the subject, about the whole mortgages thing, but I did pick up on a couple nuggets, like when you go to apply for a loan, because my parents want to buy a house soon, so when you go to apply for a loan, they pull the past two years of tax returns and they check out the income. Uh, that's something I didn't know. I thought, I assumed they would probably just check what you have now, maybe last year, but they pulled both years. So I'm like, mom, you want to get a loan in like two years, you better start planning now, get to get your tax returns in order now, start building your credit now. And she was like, why? Why? And I'm like, Ma, I learned this at the convention. It has to be true. So, yeah, that's that's the only thing I think I learned. Unless, Pascal, you have something else? What did I learn? You actually learn a lot of stuff. It's just you probably are forgetting it at the moment because you're under the gun. 
but you learn about tax return consistency of, of income. So not just the fact that you have two years of tax returns and that they're showing money, but it's consistency of income. So meaning like you, this, the money you're getting, it's consistent for the two years. So like say you worked as a job for like 20,000 and then next year you made 30,000. One, when you're getting a loan, they wanna know why. So by having the right mortgage lender, that guy or us would be able to explain to them, this is the reason why, and explain a logical reason for the bank to give you a loan based off of the 30,000 of income instead of the 20,000 of income. Because that's a big difference on your loan approval, right? $10,000 is a lot of money. Uh, difference when you're especially when you're talking about 20 to 30 um, and credit credit is key uh, different programs I mean we, we have programs that we can get you into a house for as little as like five to eight thousand dollars you can own a place and be owning your own place instead of paying rent so there's a lot of those government loans out there that are um, you know helpful um, there's a lot of loans right now you could get into a, a fourplex live in one for, and rent out the other three a lot of good deals out there so you just got to know the game so I'm going to go over, okay, any pointers on how to get the most approved on a loan? So there's there's mo one aspect is the higher the credit you are, the more they'll let you borrow based off of your income. So let's just make it simple. If someone had income, consistent income of $100,000 a year, a person with good credit is going to be able to get more of a loan than a person with lower credit. That's one. Two, the way that the type of loan you get, depending on your down payment, you can leverage it differently to get a loan, uh, meaning the, the size of the loan. Three, if you're having down payment issues and you need your payment to be lower, depending on how much your PMI is, there's different ways for you could have to play with the PMI and play with your down payment to maximize your loan amount. And what is PMI? Private mortgage insurance. Private mortgage insurance. So when you're pinning down less than 20%, you're required to pay private mortgage insurance. Now there's one through FHA, and then there's the other programs where you could, you could do it. And you can buy it into the rate and not buy it into the rate. So all that affects your payment. It affects how much down payment you come up with and all those different factors. So depending on your situation, there's different ways to play it and tweak it. There's many pro products and they're very similar, but if you don't tweak them the right way, you're not gonna maximize your loan, you're not gonna, or you could actually lose the deal. Because if you screw it up, like it, you could screw up the deal. Like one of the things, oh, one of the big keys is don't get any new credit while you're applying for a loan. That could screw up your loan because right now they're giving you a, a home mortgage based off of your current income and current credit. Well, if you get a new loan, that's gonna screw up your ratios. So that means you're going to have to restart everything, and that's going to cost more time, which will, you normally when you sign a contract, you have 30 days to close. That can, that can screw up your closing date. So it's just too much. So just basically this rule of thumb is you're getting a lo home loan. Do not apply for anything else. And when you say it's going to ruin your ratio, do you mean it's going to ruin your credit score because they're going to do a hard pull and your credit score is going to go down? Or are you going to say by getting a new loan, there's some like back end ratio that that messes up? Death so income maybe? good. Yes. Good point. So yes, it can also change your credit score. That can affect your loan Two, It can also the main factor is your your back end ratio, which what it means is this. If you're getting a loan and they're saying that you're just at the edge of the you're, you're almost at max on how much you could be lent mm -hmm. based off of your income. You're, we're only going to let you borrow this much money. And now that's just the perfect amount to touch the top and you'll be approved. Well, now you just got a brand new cell phone on a loan. That $50 bill, if they find out about it, because now you're paying 50 bucks a month for this phone. If they find out about it, now if you're spent, they have to add that into your loan amount. Because remember, all loans go into your loan amount. Mm -hmm. All loans. So your credit card payment per month, your phone bill, if that shows up on your credit report, if they find out about it, your car loan, uh, your student loans, and then the home loan. They add up all of those loan bills and they divide it by how much cash you're bringing in a month. And that is your back end ratio. If you get a new loan that screws up your ratio even more, you'll be declined for the loan. 
So that's why you just don't want to get anything new while you're applying for a loan. So and based off of your credit and other factors, everybody's back-end ratio is different. And everybody's lenders are different. So we're going to have a whole bunch of options. So someone's lender could say no to you where we could find another lender that's okay with taking on a higher uh, loan to value or higher debt to income or take on lower credit. So we're willing to, to, to get with those lenders to help a lot of the newer buyers out because uh, I know it, at the beginning you're not making that much money. Uh, any suggestions on guys that make a good salary in California and what to buy a multifamily in your area? Do you have a PM you work with lenders? Um, yes, we do have uh, – we're going to be go working with other private lenders. So we'll be able to have – we'll have about two or three options of private lenders that work in California. So, yeah, we'll be able to uh, point you in a direction. If you DM us, uh, we'll be able to tell you – who to work with, get things started for you. Um, and if you're making a good salary, you might not need a private lender. You could probably go with a conventional lender that will give you a better rate. So it depends your situation. If you're doing like a fix or flip, um, if you're doing a fix and rent, uh, if you're going to do a uh, fix and then could live in it yourself, there's different loans you want to get for each option. Um, so it depends on your lo what you're trying to do. Well, why is Diego coming at me like that? Dude, stop, Dude, playing, stop with playing with your... Diego. Is that your son? <laughs> Diego, please. Let me hold this. <laughs> Who's Diego? Do you know that person personally? I do not. Diego. <laughs> oh. Please. I'm not sure if you meant for that comment to come off rude. However, do not fret. I will not take it personal, and I will continue. Basque, I will continue to help you. Get to your financial goals. Pascal's alias. Your financial spirit animal. That's Pascal. Who am I? Nobody. Let Pascal help you. Please. Thank you. All right. All right, Joe. All right. That was Joe, everybody. Uh, so you can see how little we get done in the day with Joe playing with his hair. All right. Um, all right. All right. All right. Let's see. What other questions? Do you invest in land development? Um, so Diego, uh, great question. Good question. Um, normally, if you're starting off, I started for cash flow. So I'm big into getting cash flow. I'm big into buying properties and fixing them up and making that huge equity jump uh, quickly. If you develop in land, it, you can make cash flow. You can make a lot of profit in the development by making something out of this piece of land. The problem, the pro, the problem. I can hear you. Quiet down, please. Um, it takes a long time to develop that land, so it takes a very long time to become profitable. So you have to be really careful about going that route, uh, especially in the beginning. I would say you should get some more time, get some properties, get some, get some consistency uh, first before you go that route, because it's it's a riskier game. Because you have to turn that around pretty quickly and you don't want to get caught um, with those problems too. Anytime you do major construction, if you don't have a solid team, the pers the people you're working with can leave you hanging like, and you're, you're stuck. So it can be very costly to try to fix any of those problems. So yeah, eventually I do want to become a full developer where I'm doing like big plazas. And but as of right now – oh, sorry about that. As of right now, I'm just holding off on that. What is a process do you recommend applying for a pre-approved loan? Uh, it's not really – almost anybody will give you a pre-approval. Don't worry about the whole pre-approval. You actually want to find a real lender um, that's going to know your situation, review your tax returns, review your um, credit, review all of those – your, your, your source of income and check all of the issues that you can have when you go to underwriting. The lender is not the problem. The underwriter – is the person that determines if you're going to be approved or not. So you want to make sure everything's in order and clean the way they want to see it so you're approved at the end of the day. You go to almost any broker and like again, um, we're going to be doing loans, but we try to – I'm going to shoot you straight. Any broker's going to be like, yeah, 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 here's a letter. Hoping that you go to property and they you buy a pro get a loan from them so they can make their money. 
you really want to make sure that you have the broker that's going to spend the time, review the documents, and make sure that, look, these are all the possible issues you might have. Try to address these over the next few months before you go and apply for a loan with a bank. Because if you apply and you have not fixed those things without a good broker checking it first, it's already on the radar. The second it's on the radar, you're going to be like, there's going to be a magnifying glass on that problem. But if you fix the problem before they actually get submitted to them, it's not on the radar and they're going to be cool with it. So remember, when they're loaning money to people, they want to make sure that they're fiscally responsible and they're and they're knowledgeable. So take time to get with a broker, a, a lender, and have them review and educate you before you go down that path. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Nico. Pascal is fifty dollars in fantasy football a wise investment. Uh, that is not investment. FYI. Not an investment. This is not an investment. <laughs> um, so that's a gamble. <laughs> right? It's called gambling. All right? There is some people that are very good at gambling, but at the end of the day, it's gambling. Um, Joe is a question. wise man. All right. Question. Some people say, I have one investment. It's my house. Is the house cons- is your home, the one you live in, considered an investment? I, I do not consider homes an investment. The home you live in is an asset, mm-hmm. right? right? It's an asset. It is not an investment. An investment you put money in and you're getting money out of it, right? You're getting a – like a dividend out of it. You're getting – there is there is business being done in the investment and there's generating – it is a resellable based off of the business that it's, it's, that it's in, right? So if you buy a stock, that is an investment. There is there is business being done and generated within that, that area. Um, if you're buying your home, it's not technically – an. it's not really a true – what I would consider a true investment. It's more of an asset. Um, so you can invest in homes, but let's not confuse the two because if you're stuck – so let's just give you an example. A lot of people take all their money and they get the maximum loan they could get um, to buy a house. And they get the biggest house possible. And then they have no money left to invest in other stuff, building cash flow or buying other rental properties and things like that. The issue with with that that thanks, Joe. My phone's dying, guys. Um, the issue with that is now your house your house rich, but your cash poor. Market tanks. You lose your job. You lose hours. Excuse me. You also lost your house. So. That's where you know you really don't want to put yourself in that type of situation, and that's why I don't count your house as really an investment because you can't just do something and get more money. It doesn't you know? It's you can't go to the bank and get more money if things go bad. Like you're 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 kind of in a stuck situation. Um, so unless you're gonna go in like Airbnb a room, which is an option, right? You should if you have all these empty rooms. But then again, most people don't want people in their house with strangers that they don't know, you know. If I currently just purchased a new construction home just two years ago, can I get another loan for a fixer-upper? Yes. Fixer-upper loans are different than home loans. Based off of your investment experience will also base off of the interest rate the investor is going to be charging you. So what's awesome about – excuse me. What's awesome about uh, uh, fixer-flip loans is they, they're partnering with you. That's what they are. The, the loan, they're, they're charging you like – so fix or flip loans, if you're good, you have a lot of experience like myself, you're going to be in like the sevens and eights. If you're new in the game, they're going to charge you more like 12. Um, and 12 and two, is the interest rate. Correct? 12 is the interest rate. Okay. So if it's a $100,000 loan, they're going to charge you $12,000 a year. So if you're borrowing it for each month, you're going to pay $1,000. So that's your interest. And then you're going to pay two points up front. So if it's a $100,000 loan, two points up front means $2,000 up front you're going to pay. Basically, you got to look at it as that bank is your partner. So they want to cut and uh, for taking the risk. So they'll give you the loan. Most of them don't care what your credit looks like. They don't care what a lot of stuff looks like. They want to first see the – they'll look at the deal and they'll be like, oh, wow, this deal has money. Yeah, we'll give you the money because if you screw up, we'll just take it. You know. Um, and honestly, any partner would do the same thing. Yo, you screwed up. I'm taking it. I'm not going to risk – I'm not going to lose my money too. 
And it's actually usually still not a bad deal if you're thinking about it because if you're being charged 12% interest and you don't have much experience, they're, they're, they're covering like 90% of the, the buying it and 90% of fixing it. Um, you're only putting up 10% and managing the project. That's a really good deal. You know, I think it's really it's a fair deal. But you got to be careful. Again, because a lot of people lose their ass on these deals because they don't know what they're doing. Uh, most of the time because they're buying too much property. They're buying way uh, – they're buying uh, – meaning they're paying too much for the property because all the profit is in the buy. That's when you make your money, buying the property at a really good low price because if you don't buy it low enough, you, there's no profit, right? Sure. Uh, you're not buying it as a hobby and then just to break even. Hey, Georgie. Oh, Dream Team. Yes, sir. I see you, big George. Hey, hey bro. I hope you are fine. I am good. Thank you. Thoughts on REITs. Um, First to find a REIT. A REIT. Real Estate Investment uh, Trust, which trust, basically yep. is buying a um, – a, you can buy it on stock market. And they're – basically you're buying a company that invests in real estate and they give you a cut. Um that is an option, you know. That, that is definitely an option where if you want to buy real estate that way, I don't think you get the biggest bang because, like, if you do something like with, um, like, I have a uh, investment group, right, where people will give me their money and then I buy the deal. They buy the deal with me and I do everything, right? There's a lot less overhead when you're doing like, a deal with like an individual investing with an individual than you are with like a REIT. There's a lot more overhead. And normally the deals aren't – normally they're not as profitable. I'm not saying all REITs are, right? So you need to do your own due diligence when you're when you're picking out these deals. And then two, you don't really know what you're exactly buying, you know, 100% where if you're buying with an investment group and there's local ones as well, um, you'll know exactly what you're buying. A so – That's a syndicate, right? It's a syndicate or a real estate investment group, but, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. So Pedro – all right, so Brad, built hatch twenty two. What do you suggest is the best way to get a loan if you own your house and want to add a pool or interior modifications? Is a refinance better? Home equity loan. I only been in the house for two years. So, what is your current interest rate? And then what I would do is like again DM me and I can look into this for you. But so what I would do is look at one. What is your current interest rate? Right, And then what is the current market interest rate? After I determine that, I'm going to see, too, what do you owe on the house? What is the value of the house now? What's the difference? Is the current interest rate – if I did a – for example, if I did a cash-out refi where I did a refinance and took money out and gave it to you, and the interest rate of that is less than what you currently are paying and you got the extra money – then I might go that way. You know, that, that's a win. Um, if it didn't make sense, then there's an option where you can get a home equity line of credit. Home equity line of credit means you get it against the, the credit, the value of your home, the extra value above your loan amount. And then you can use the money when you need it. So say you're going to put in the pool, you're going to put in whatever else. They're going to charge you usually interest only. And then as you... Um, as you have more money, you can just pay off the line of credit, and then it's just there like a credit card that's attached to your house. So that's another option for you. Uh, and then there's a HELOC, which a HELOC means it's the same thing. It's a second loan on your house for the extra value of your home, but they give you fixed payments. And you'll be like, hey, give me you know, $50,000 because I want to put a pool in and give me payments for 10 years so I can make sure I can pay off this HELOC in 10 years. So those are the three options. Um, personally, I – don't like HELOCs. I or not HELOCs. I don't like home equity loans. I go either with a HELOC, or I go with a cash out refi. One of the two. Um, it's just because it just doesn't make sense for me, at least, to be in the middle. I'd like to be either one end or the other. How much do I need to invest with you? Um, that's really on an investor by investor basis, right? Like I have to look at the person's background, see what their knowledge they have. Um, their experience, like there's people that have come up and said, hey, I want to give you money and I'm, I look at their history and I talk to them, DM me, and they just seem like if they gave me this money, they would have zero money left and that's not healthy for them. So it doesn't make sense because 
you need to have cash in the bank in case something goes down. Because think about it this, in a real estate deal, if you put all your money into a real estate deal, and you got no cash left, when things go down, you're gonna try to get out of the deal and be like, hey, I need my money back. Well, in a real estate deal, you usually don't get your money back for like five years. So maybe you'll get some cash flow, but you ain't, if you put in 25,000, you can't get the 25,000 right away because it's in the deal. So, and it's not, especially on commercial investment, you can't get cash out that quick. So you gotta be kind of careful. So what is your, uh, Thanks. what's the magic number to invest with you though? All things, everything's going good. Um, what's the number that you consider? Honestly, it really has to be like a minimum of probably at least 10,000. Okay. But that's like, and it has to be the right person. Um, but most people, like the real number, like the real, real number is like $100,000. Mm-hmm. Because at 100000 and a person has sufficient funds in the bank behind them, then I know they're not going to, they're going to understand, look, we're not touching this money for another five years, maybe 10 years. Um, we are planning to give, like, obviously, I, my goal is to get rent right away, right? To make rent, to make it a cash flow. But, you know, you know, the right investor understands that. Some people, in the when they first get started, they don't. And they are too sensitive, I think is the right word. Okay. They're too sensitive and they don't understand that the business doesn't function how we want it to function. It It is its own animal and you have to kind of respect that, right? Like, so initially when I was buying, the, when I bought the nine unit, um, so initially when I bought the nine unit, um, I was planning to get it rented and going within like two months. And now I'm planning to do Airbnb uh, for almost all the nine units. So that's going to cost me probably another one one or two months uh, in the process. So, you know, that just takes time. Um, what did George say? Thanks, Pascal and Little Cuz. Keep the great content coming. Thanks, George. We got you, George. All right. My boss asked me to bring him investors. He wants to sell a land in Georgia. I feel lost and confused. What should I do? Um, if he wants you to bring investors, first I would ask him, where do you want me to find these investors? Um, and then that will kind of get you started. Two, if you have an idea of what type of investors would be an, an interested in that land, you can then start contacting them on those platforms. Um, if you have a budget to find investors, you can then like on different platforms like Facebook or Instagram or um, LinkedIn, you can go con- you can find investors interested in that type, certain type of product. Uh, um, that that the investors for that type of area that you're looking in. So you can help use those platforms to narrow things down. So one, I would try to get an idea of where he thinks or where he has found people, investors in the past. And that should give you a good idea. Um, I don't sell land in the Middle East. That's not my, my specialty. So I can't really direct you exactly more than this general outline how people find investors in general. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Lewis, what do you think about Texas to invest with houses? I like Texas as a market. Like if I was going to leave Florida, I would want to be in Texas or Arizona. Um, I like Florida the best, obviously, but... Um, it's a really good rental market in the sense of the laws are written in the sense of in the power of the landlord. So you have a lot of power, power behind you by the laws. Um, I don't like investing in houses. You know, that's just what I don't like. I like multi-units because you get a larger return on investment in multi-units. You only have, it's easier to, when you get a loan, it's easier to get your, get a loan, get one. You don't want to have to go for four loans. So you can get one loan for a fourplex one roof, one lawn, True. one everything. You're not going through four times. You got one spot for a person to go for that four of those four units. So it makes it a lot easier, and especially if you're gonna live in one and rent out the other three, it really works out really good for you. So once Florida's real estate gets all tapped out, right? Where, what's, where's your next area to go to? Arizona or Texas. Arizona or Texas. I might hit Georgia just because I'm close to Georgia, and sometimes you get decent returns. But I would probably take a slightly lower return uh, in Arizona or Texas than go to Georgia because the laws are not as much in favor compared to Florida, Arizona, and Texas laws. Cool. What's up, Corey? Lewis, I'm 18th and my plans in the future is invest with houses. What do you recommend to get to the goal? Um, First thing is start getting your credit in order now. 
right? If you anything you want to do, you have to have a solid plan right now for that. So get your credit in order now. Start working a job now. Okay. So if you want to get into real estate investing, especially buying, renting, and holding, it's a lot. Unless you know the flipping game, where you're gonna you're gonna go and start flipping properties and just have some down payment money, and you're gonna have an investor give you uh, someone loan you the money to put as a down payment on your fix and flip, you can probably do that and to get into houses and get into rentals. If you don't go that route and you want to go the more conservative, easy route, the way I did it, you get a regular job, you work 40 hours a week, you save every single penny you get, you do that for about a year and a half, and then the bank will give you a loan. And then you say, I'm going to go buy this fourplex and I'm going to live in one of the units. So you get a homeowner, first time home buyer's loan. So it's easier with a little bit lower down payment and such. So you can get in that route in a more conservative fashion. Like if you're not super aggressive in your manner, like again, you can go into fix and flips and then try to get in that way and build your money and keep rolling your equity into the next deal. Um, or you can go the conservative route, like I said, get a job, work the job, save every penny, and then put that chunk of money down on, the, on your property and then fix that property up. Keep on fixing it up and increase your rents, increase your rents and keep on doing that. And then- um, That's how you got good. started, right? That's how I did it. I just started working at a job, working like eight bucks an hour and saving every single penny. Worked like 60 hours a week and just saved everything I could and then put a down payment on the property. And then after I did that, after a few months, I went and got a line of credit on it, right? About six months later, I got a line of credit on it. And I used that money on the line of credit to fix up the property, put in tile, clean it up, paint it so I can increase my rents. Because then I could bring in an extra 100, 200 bucks a month in rent. And by increasing your rent, you're increasing the value. Yeah, by increasing the rent, you increase the value. So for every $100 a month you increase your rent, it increases the property value about $15,000. Perfect. So two units, 100 bucks each, 200 bucks in rent increase, so that's nice money in your pocket. That increases the property value $30,000. So if you were to sell it, you could, again, you could potentially get $30,000 more than what you bought it for. Cool. Let's see what else we got here. Diego, welcome back, brother. Can you discuss your real estate portfolio? What's your net worth? That's a personal question. Uh, I mean, he just wants me to whip it out. What do you got? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, all right. So, um, so my real estate portfolio, I have – I never sold the first property I bought when I was 19, which is a duplex in Clearwater. Um, I just sold the second property I was had a duplex in. Another duplex. I just sold that. I have a five-unit property in, in, in uh, Pasco County. I have seven units in Dunedin. I have a house in Dunedin. I have a four unit in Dunedin. I got a nine unit in Safety Harbor. So I probably bought, probably bought around like 2.5 and it's worth probably like five mil. Mm -hmm. And that's only my real estate game. Now I have other companies. I have like different companies that do other things. So just the real estate game, that's what it's looking like. It's true. Oh. Nada. Hey, Vasco. How can I buy my first property and get money from it? All right. So basically, again, goes down to getting a job, saving your money, and using that money as a down payment. I got to move off of this light because this light's acting weird. So. I'll sit here. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, buy, uh, get a job, save your money, invest that money. Other than that, your other option is uh, fix and flips. If I was going to go back and be super aggressive, I would go find properties that need money um, or if it needs to be fixed. I then would buy them, uh, fix them up and sell them or buy them, fix them up and rent them out. So I, would, I did it on a less aggressive scale. I would get normal 30-year fixed rate loans, which are very conservative. If I was going to be more aggressive, I would go hard money. And because they require less money down, they charge higher, higher interest rates, but they require you usually be out of the loan within 12 months. So you got to be really quick wow. and really good. Yeah. So that's what's more aggressive. And I was trying to be more conservative on what I was doing. So I chose to go the longer way, but the safer way. So um, depends which way you want to go. 
question building off you said hard money is it you have to be out of the loan in 12 months yeah if you refinance the loan does that does that work it does but now remember you're renting out the property in whatever money you're bringing in if you're paying you know say like say you're new you're paying 12 percent interest that's literally like all of your profit right that's true so that's that two if you refi into another hard money loan you're paying another one to two percent that's a lot of money um and then uh so that's why you want to refinance into a normal conventional loan mm -hmm. you fix the property up you rented it out you have 12 month tenants and now you're refinancing to a conventional loan that's a 30-year fixed rate loan that's like under five percent and your payment just dropped less than half so now that's all your profit your profit comes to cutting the expenses of the property lowering your interest on the prop on the loans mm -hmm. making it a 30-year loan instead of like a 15-year loan making the payment as small as possible you increased your cash flow now i don't see any value getting a 30 15-year uh, loan you should always get a 30 you want to pay it off faster just pay, make a higher payment but if things go bad at least now you're only guaranteed to make the lower payment That's not true. not stuck on a 15-year payment I'm for I'm Puerto Rico and I want to invest in properties okay so you can buy properties in Puerto Rico you can buy properties in America it's really up to you how you want to do that all of Puerto Rico almost everywhere except like the where the Ritz Carlton is because I think it's like Ritz Carlton there almost the whole island is a qualified opportunity fund so if you invest with it in the right if you create the right portfolio have the right setup you can basically have all of your profits be tax free so after Katrina they they basically did that well like someone an opportunity fund is real quick just simply that's a not a simple answer that's, but I'll make it as simple as possible yeah. qualified opportunity fund is a fund that's approved by the government by like myself I'm an accountant I can create the fund um I know how to create the fund. And then you have the fund, and that fund, you put your money in it. That fund will then buy properties okay. in a qualified opportunity zone. It's an area that the government said, this is an area that is permitted to have uh, a qualified opportunity fund buy it. And any profits you make on the property when you sell it in 10 years is tax-free. Mm -hmm. That's what it cool. means. Tax-free gain on your sale after 10 years of ownership. There's also a lot of other tax benefits involved as well, but um, – Simply put. Simply that's put, that's that. I've been eyeing a quaplex in Vegas. Do it. I just changed to pending. Should I have pulled the trigger on it? No, fuck it. Um, True. There's a lot of deals I missed out on, and they motivated me. Like last year – I missed out on like three amazing deals and I effed it up. I effed it up. I effed it up. Like I'm not going to say any, anything else than I effed it up. Like the moon aligned. Like right there. Let me show you. See those moons? All of those moons effing aligned in the, in the deal. And I still screwed it up and didn't pull the trigger because I had other shit going on. And I was like, I can't take this on when I got all this other shit going on. So it happens, bro. Get over it. Keep your eye. You know what? You know what? I'll give you a sad story for even even worse story, right? Me not pulling the trigger on that deal is nothing. Do you know what the worst part is? This guy was going to pull the trigger on a deal, didn't pull the trigger on a deal, said, I'm never going to get another deal again, had like 25K saved up, blew it on cars and stupid shit, like bought a whatever car, like, okay, at 25K. There is no car out there that's nice enough to be like, I'm going to blow 25K on it, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, and then be like, I'm going to give up my future over whatever. So he blew it on a, he blew it on a car, uh, on, a, on a thing with a Mustang and like other shit. And, um, and then like six months later after blowing it, he had another awesome deal come up that he couldn't do because he blew all the money he saved for like three years. That's even worse. So – Keep your head up. Save your money. Shit's going to work out. I promise you. I mean, I've been through a lot of shit. Like, again, when I started, I had to work for like – I was cleaning toilets. So yeah. so don't think it's going to like be bad forever. Yeah, yeah, we all have our bad days, depressing days, but – we get through it. An even better deal coming around the corner for you. Yeah, and the, yeah, for sure. And then now, this is the best part. I tell everybody, look at 100 deals 
then on online, on the computer, run the numbers like you're going to buy it. Just run the data. What, what is the rent going to make? How much is my mortgage going to payment going to be? What's the down payment that I need? Run all the numbers. What are the, how much are the rents other people pay in the area? What do they look like inside? What does this property look like? How much is the rent for the property is remodeled and not remodeled? So you can see all those details. Once you have all those factors, then you know what a good deal is. So when a de good deal comes up and another player like me comes in and I'm buying it within the minute and you're trying to figure it out, then you know what's up. Yep. Um, now, sometimes there is some deals that are up there for six months. That's fine if they're up there for six months. Now you know you have more room to negotiate mm -hmm. and it's in a bad situation. So you can come and look, the property's not going to sell for this much because it's in a bad situation. Look. Look at this, 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 and this example. All these examples are the same price as yours, but fully remodeled. You need to take 80000 off your price if you yep. really want to sell it. And you have 20, 30 of those conversations, someone's going to say yes. You get that property for 80000 off. You put about 30000 into it. Maybe day one you buy it and you just rent it out to, for like a cheaper amount. But over the next year or two, you're going to fix it up, get a home equity line of credit, put in the 30000 now you built in up to fifty thousand of equity. Now you sell it, get your cash back plus fifty thousand profit. Not to mention the rent you're raising and the income going up, the property value, and the money you made on the rent yep. and everything else. All it's of it. it's all gravy, man. And how much your principal you paid down. So, yeah, eight bucks an hour. I mean, I know everyone's like saying, "Hey, this like not, people aren't making a lot of money nowadays," but like. 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I was getting paid seven, eight dollars an hour. That's true. So right now, most people are getting paid like 10 to 15 bucks an hour. So remember, it was only 12 years ago, I was getting paid like seven, eight bucks an hour. So things have gone up a lot. Expenses have too. Rents doubled. So, true. you know, you're in it for the long haul. Don't give up and like blow money and make a bad decision just because you didn't get what you wanted today. What's the best way to build a great credit? Good question, Lewis. You're All talking right. to the right guy for that one. So, one, have at least two credit cards. If you're going to get a car loan, get it from a big institution, a bank, or uh, like Toyota or Honda or something like that. Not a buy here, pay here, because they won't report your credit to the bureaus. You usually don't. So when you have all those credit places reporting positive things about you they're saying good stuff about you which increases your credit score um you can also add your name as a co-owner to a credit card your parents own or a sibling owns as a co-owner you're also going to be responsible for the debt that's on the cards but you're also going to get all the good history from it so if it's a five-year card you get five years of credit history from it now if it's bad history you're also going to be taking on the bad history so make sure that they're not high debt on the card that they've never been laid on the card because you don't want to take on that bad history what is the most amount of money do you need to invest in multifamily it depends on what the cost of the property is and what is the goal because if you're doing a fix and flip you know you might only need 10 percent of the purchase and 10 percent of the um remodel if you're buying and holding as your primary residence, you you can get loans with us for like three and a half percent down plus closing costs. So you could be in a deal for like eight grand, um, but then you're living in it, right? It's your primary residence. Thanks. I'm a genius. I appreciate that. Hello, real estate mom. All right. Do you think trading on Bitcoin is something good or wasting time and money? All right. So there's going to be... What's going to happen with Bitcoin is like a huge up in the air type of thing. Mm -hmm. It's not my thing because I work with stuff that have a really fixed value. Okay. So one, I don't like anything that doesn't give me money. Bitcoin does not really pay you money. Um, so I'm not interested in for that part. If I'm going to be owning assets like currencies or silver and gold, I'd prefer to own silver and gold in physical form. So I have something physical that I have. So as you can see, I like own, owning the properties physically, not through a REIT. I like owning – you can buy silver and gold through a stock. 
I don't want silver gold stock. Big on tangible assets. I want a tangible asset. I want to own a company. I want to own – if I want to buy a company with a partner, then I want to own something that's a physical company, right? So I'm big on that. That's me personally. Am I going to go with into less tangible stuff soon? Yes, but I'm big on having a tangible asset. You got plans? What? You got plans to get other assets? What's that? The real estate uh, mortgage company. Oh, true. Right? It's not really, you can't really touch it. That's true. It's really about, so in the real, like the mortgage company we're opening, if you can't touch it, right? Like it's, it's all based off of your skill and how fast you are and the relationships you're creating in the mortgage industry. So I have a lot of relationships. I know what I'm doing. So I have the intellectual properties of the company. The ability is off based off of me. So like that's a non-tangible company. I'm okay with it because the old, everything that's non-tangible is in my head. So, you know, it's it's a good play. You know, we don't know what's going to happen with Bitcoin, and it's not truly foreseeable. Th that's that. Was I was I going to buy Bitcoin like eight years ago? Yeah, I was going to buy it when it was like thirty dollars a coin, and I ended up buying more silver at that time, and didn't end up buying the Bitcoin. So it would be like half a million Bitcoin right now. Uh, am I mad? Not really. Don't care. Shit happens. Um, so. Thank you to everyone for joining the live. Let's go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Got a few more minutes left. Uh, you're awesome, bro. Thanks for the motivation and the gas. Um, you're very welcome. We got a lot more stuff to come. I'm coming out with the class. Yes, we will. Um, putting a lot of late nights for the class. And this is the deal. If you take my class. It's going to point you in a direction and help you get your loan closed, right? Because there's a lot of details on making sure to getting the property, getting approved for loans and stuff like that. Now, this is the one big difference that between my class and the other like millionaire real estate classes out there. You take my class, I think it's, I think it's probably, I'm probably going to try to make it like cheap, affordable. It's like 500 bucks, right? You take my class, pay the 500 bucks. If you come back to me, to get a loan, I will give you the five hundred dollars back on Perfect. your closing statement. Perfect. So, you learn how to get to the deal, and then when you come back to me to get the loan, I give you the five hundred back towards your closing. So that way, it's like you're an investing in yourself, and then you come back to me for getting the loans. Then, hey, I'm gonna give you five hundred back. It's good business, you know. I, I I have an insurance company. I have an accounting firm, and um, opening up this mortgage company. So I always have this thing of like, it's called bundling. Like the more stuff you get with me, the cheaper the price gets. So again, you get the class with me and then you come get the loan with me. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to make it cheaper for everybody. How much do you recommend someone to have saved before investing in a multifamily? The, the amount, the amount, so that's why like you need to get it personally reviewed. Like I'll actually have to see everything to give you a straight answer. The amount varies from person to person, right? Like state to state, state to state, person to person. What do you do for a living? How much do you make? How much is the property you're trying to buy, right? So like normally you're gonna want to have like four or five months of reserves. So if you're gonna buy a property and it's cost you a thousand bucks a month, mortgage, taxes, and insurance, you know, you're gonna want five thousand in the bank after you put down your down payment. Mm -hmm. Not only you, the bank's gonna want to see that too because Remember, all these loans, excuse me, all these loans are backed by the federal government. The federal government is basically saying, we're going to give you this loan because that's really where the money is coming from. So when they're doing that, they're like, they want to make sure that when they give you this loan and their goal is to give money away, that you're not going to lose this house. So they're going to want to make sure that you have probably at least five times the monthly payment and like savings. So if you're going to buy $8,000, you should probably have like $13,000 saved up. Welcome, buddy. Let's see. Let's see what Luke said. Learned more. Learned more on this live than my first year at FSU. Thanks, Pascal and Joe. Luke, we got you. Luke, uh, Luke I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, bro. You learned more today on this live than you will next year as well at FSU. That's true. Um, no joke. I went I – I did it so – when I was like one of the first people that did uh, this thing called like early college and um, it was like 
20 of us in all of early college. There was only like 20 people at uh, doing it. And uh, the first – what I realized – and I left high school like in, in the junior year to do early college. And I realized after I was taking some classes, I was like, wait a minute. Everything the first two years of college was a repeat of junior year and senior year of high school. Like literally you're repeating the same exact information. Yep. I'm like, this is really dumb. This is really useless. Yeah, it's quite useless. <laughs> and then – um. And it barely helped towards my actual major, you know? Mm-hmm. Like my original original thing I was going for back then was uh, chemical engineering, right? Wow. I learned very little about <laughs> chemical engineering. <laughs> I, I took chemistry, you know, Gen Chem 1, Gen Chem 2, Orgo 1, Orgo 2. But um, yeah, they, what they do is what's retarded is – and I'm, not, I'm really against it because my class is not focused on that at all. But in, in college, they literally, the first two years, they weeding you out. Mm-hmm. The first two years, they say, the first, because you take Gen Chem 1, Gen Chem 2, Orgo 1, Orgo 2, Physics 1, Physics 2, Calc 1, 2, 3, and Differential Equations. Well, I was like, what's the purpose of this? Because it doesn't really seem like everything is applicable. They said, because they're trying to weed out people out of the engineering program. Yep. So explain to me how you pay $30,000 a year. <laughs> And their goal is to have you fail. That is a horrible business. My goal is to take $30,000 for you for the first two years and fuck you. That is <laughs> like that is, that is really effed up. So no, my class is, ba- is like this. You're going to take the class because my goal is that you buy a property and you are successful with it. And then you're going to come back with me by learning so much and say, hey, Pascal, I want you to give me the loan. And that's where I'm going to make my real money. The real money I'm going to make is, is doing the loan for you, not charging you 500 for the class. True. And I'm hoping that you be so successful that you don't just buy one property. You end up buying 10 properties. So now I got people coming back getting 10 loans from me. So I'm not making money on the $500 class. That's just I'm like losing money on my time. But I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm going to invest in the front end. Save in the back end. And I'm going to save in the back end that I have and not paying all this money in marketing to get people to come to me. Everyone's just coming on their own because I'm teaching. I'm giving away so much content, so much gold that people don't even – you can't go anywhere and really get this info that I'm giving out for free. And that – but because I'm giving up so much, investing so much in the front end with all you guys that you're going to be so financially smart and literate that one day you're going to come to me and be like, I want a loan. I want another loan. I want another loan. Then eventually you're growing your businesses. You ask me business questions. I teach you about that. And eventually you have so much money. You're like, you know what? Here's $100,000. Here's a million dollars. Invest it in this portfolio. I want in on your like apartment complex deal. That's my goal. Two minutes out, guys, just so you know. Let's go. Let's get some rapid, let's get some rapid answers. What are your thoughts on the recent interest rate cuts? They're let's getting go. lower. They're getting lower. It's good shit, um, which also makes me concerned about what's going to happen in the market long term. You know, shit goes crazy during the uh, uh, real est- uh, during the election years. When you said ten percent of the down payment and ten percent of the remodeling, what did you mean? So, say you're buying a property for two hundred thousand dollars. It's a flicks and flip. You're buying it for two hundred thousand. So, they all they want is twenty percent down, uh, twenty thousand down, and then say the remodeling is another fifty thousand. They're only going to want another five thousand five thousand for that. So you're paying twenty five thousand down. And the hard money lender would lend you the other two hundred and twenty five thousand mm-hmm. to buy it and fix it. Yep. All right. And then you're going to sell it and pay them off and you keep your profit. Go. What do you think of BRRR method? I don't know what the BRRR method is on the top of my head right now. Um, why only 10 percent? Do you mean you get a loan for the remodeling instead of using your own money? Yes, you can Precisely. get a loan. Yes, you can do that. Uh, expect, the better you get, the more money they'll let you borrow. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, they'll cover almost everything because, hey, they make 10 percent. You make a lot of money. Everyone's happy. At the end of the day, that's why I did the class too. I make a little bit of money to break even for my time. You learn. You're going to end up making money when you're buying deals. You're going to come back to me to get the loans. I make money. You make more money on your deals. You make money. And how it works is if everybody makes money, everybody's happy. Yep. And that's how you need to set it up. If you are greedy 
and you only want yourself to make money. You're a pig. You get slaughtered. The lender's a bull. They make, uh, the lender's a bear. They make money. You're a bull. You make money.